I want to say one more thing that wasn't in Search for a Nonviolent Future about uh, how prisons work as an environment. A colleague of mine at Stanford, Philip Zimbardo, carried out a, an experiment which is quite famous now. They've even done a film about it called the Stanford Prison Experiment, I think. Where he took uh, Stanford students and arbitrarily divided them into prisoners and guards and had them just act out this role of prisoner guard for a while. And within a short period of time, I think we're talking about one week, uh, one of his coworkers, who then became his wife, uh, and we, we taught at Berkeley for a while, she said, we have to stop this experiment because the guards were being, the guards, quote unquote, were being so sadistic. And it reminded me on a much lighter vein of an anecdote that my mentor at Berkeley, Alan Renoir, told me that uh, he was on the set as a little boy when his father was filming uh, Great Expectations, World War I set film. And Again, the extras came in and they were given different uniforms perfectly arbitrarily, depending on what size you were when you got up to the window. So you had a few men who were in officers' uniforms. And after a couple of weeks on the set, when there was a lunch break, the officers would congregate all together. And if one of the enlisted men made the mistake of walking by, an officer would say, uh, my good man, get me a carafe of red, will you? And of course, and he immediately obeyed. So this is by way of seeing once again that merely constructing a system in which some human beings are put in cages and other human beings are in charge of them is a prescription for segregation, separateness, and disaster. And as uh, people said in the civil rights movement, there is no such thing as separate but equal. Separate implies unequal. So, uh, finally, uh, I started uh, talking about the fact that uh, the way our present system works, it waits until it's too late. It waits until people have taken to offensive behavior and then tries to deal with them. And after all this talking about the restorative justice system that could be brought in, first to the schools and then to the prisons, uh, I then have to say, but you know what? Uh, this is not really going to be enough. We have to operate on the social forces that are causing people to feel so alienated in the first place. And let me give you a more contemporary example now, the question of gun control. Uh, we recently have been through an event where Democratic members of Congress staged a sit-in in Congress and on our radio program we devoted a whole show to that because it's such an interesting event. It uh, brings so much to light about nonviolence. But at the end of the show, I made this point that people are talking about technological solutions. You know, we have smart guns that only their owner can fire them. They're talking, uh, which is a little bit more intelligent, about legal solutions where we, the U.S. would start acting like most civilized countries and make uh, certain uh, access to weapons illegal. That's okay, well and good. But the one thing that nobody has talked about yet is the human solution. Why are so many Americans reaching out for guns? We now have more guns in this country then we have people. Why? What is driving them? And what could get them over that? So uh, I guess I'd like to leave you with two thoughts uh, today. Think back to those conversion experiences of Cabrera and Cardoso and uh, those kids who were the biggest troublemakers who become the biggest uh, mediators. See if you can think of some examples of your own and then uh, think about the question, what is it that causes people to feel they need to possess guns? I know fear, of course, is gonna come up right away, but uh, what we're leading up to is a discussion of what is real security. So think about that, if you will, and I will be back with you next week.